Welcome to Church on the Go. I'm Ed, and this is Sammy, and we're so glad you're here today. Church on the Go is a new ministry of Messiah Church, offering a message and music in about 30 minutes. Listen while you're grocery shopping, in the school pickup line, putting away the laundry. We'd love to know that you joined today, so click the link below or head to messiahchurch.org slash let's go. This Lenten season, this 40 days before Easter, we're working through the Gospel of Luke. Today, Pastor Tammy is sharing a message about healing and hope. If you'd like to spend some time diving deeper into Luke, there's an online small group that meets Wednesdays at 6.45 p.m. There's also a Gospel of Luke reading guide over at messiahchurch.org slash Luke. We hope today's message and music bring a holy moment to your busy day. So far in this message series on Luke, we've seen how Jesus seeks out the most unlikely to use in his ministry and mission, the very old and the very young, women and those who recognize themselves as sinners in need of God's grace and mercy. Today we hear a story about how Jesus seeks out and heals those who are treated as outsiders simply because they are sick. I'm reading from Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, 10 men with skin diseases approached him. Keeping their distance from him, they raised their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, show us mercy. When Jesus saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priest. As they left, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he had been healed, returned and praised God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus replied, weren't 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? No one returned to praise God except this foreigner. And then Jesus said to him, get up and go. Your faith has healed you. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing and the understanding of the word. Well, it's March. You know what that means. March Madness, St. Patrick's Day, the first day of spring, and if you're a student or a teacher, spring break. Last week, the University of Minnesota was on spring break, and so Jerry and I took a trip, just the two of us, to Austin, Texas. Having lived there in the early 90s when Jerry worked with the Longhorn Marching Band at the University of Texas, we used some of our time to visit with old friends, to soak up some of that warm Texas sunshine, to drive and hike through the beautiful Texas hill country. And we were delightfully surprised to find that the blue bonnets are already blooming early this year. That was a completely unexpected treat. But before we left, preparing for a trip like this took some planning. First, there was coordinating the plane tickets with the hotel and the rental car reservations. And then there was figuring out rides to and from our home and to the airport. We needed to make plans for someone to take care of our dog, someone to bring in the mail, someone getting our garbage to the curb and back on the right day. And oh, because of the snow, I mean, of course it snowed, right? We needed someone to run a snowblower up and down our driveway just a couple of times. So it wasn't obvious that we weren't home. And then figuring out what to do once we were in Texas, well, that was a whole nother list of to-dos. When you take a trip like this, there's a lot of details that need to be taken care of, but when you do, it's all worth the effort. Well, during this season of Lent, we have been reading through the Gospel of Luke together and looking each week at this overarching theme of his Gospel, 
which is that Jesus came to lift up the lowly, reaching out to, having compassion for, and caring for the outsiders and the outcast. Today we're going to focus on the part of Luke's gospel that tells about Jesus' journey from Galilee to his crucifixion and death in Jerusalem. It begins in Luke 9, and we read, As the time approached when Jesus was to be taken up into heaven, he determined to go to Jerusalem. Now, some translations say he determined to go, some say he set his face towards or resolutely set out for, all indications that even though he knew that he would face persecution and death in Jerusalem, he was determined to go there. And this journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, a trip that should have taken about nine days, actually ends up being about 40% of Luke's gospel. It's not until 10 chapters later, in chapter 19, that Jesus arrives in Jerusalem. Because Luke takes so much time with this journey, it's an indication that he thinks it's important. And therefore, we should pay close attention. It's in these 10 chapters where we find some of Jesus' greatest teachings There's the two great commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. It's where we hear stories about Zacchaeus and Mary and Martha. It's where Jesus teaches us the Lord's Prayer. And it's where we find some of our most loved parables. Along this journey, we hear about the Good Samaritan, the rich man and Lazarus, and the prodigal son. Well, today I want to focus on this story of the 10 lepers. This is a story that draws attention to two important themes in Luke's gospel. Jesus' care and compassion for the marginalized, those considered outsiders and outcasts, and secondly, the importance and the power of gratitude. Let's start with the first part of today's scripture. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Now, you may recall the relationship between Samaritans and Jews at this time was conflicted, sometimes even violent. See, centuries before, they had been one people, but changes and tensions wrought by the Babylonian exile and then the return put them at odds regarding beliefs about scripture and worship and what it meant to be holy. The Jews did not like the Samaritans and the Samaritans did not like the Jews. Well, here's a map. I think it might be helpful in understanding what's going on here. Now, up in the northern part of this area, that's called Galilee. This is where Jesus grew up, where he spent most of his life in his ministry. Galilee included a large number of Jews, but also many foreigners or immigrants. The center of this area is called Samaria, roughly the area that's considered to be the West Bank today, home to the Palestinians. And the southern area, that was Judea. This is where Jesus was born. This is where Bethlehem is. Now, there were two main routes that Jews would take to get from Galilee to Jerusalem for their religious festivals. The most direct route was to go straight through Samaria, But good Jews would do all that they could to stay out of that area and away from those bad Samaritans. The other route was to go to the east, crossing over the Jordan River and then traveling south, and then back to the west, into Judea and on to Jerusalem, avoiding Samaria altogether. Well, Luke tells us that Jesus and his disciples were traveling along the border area between Samaria and Galilee This means that this entire encounter between Jesus and the 10 men with skin diseases took place in a geographical borderland that is neither Samaria nor Galilee. Chicano author Gloria Andalzua writes about the American-Mexican border, and she describes borderlands this way. Borderlands are more than geographical boundaries. They are psychic, social, and cultural terrains that we inhabit and that inhabit all of us. Borders are set up to divine places that are safe and unsafe, to draw lines that distinguish us from them. This may be why Luke places this healing encounter in this hybrid space, this place that transcends culture and religion, economics and politics, just like Jesus. 
and draws our attention towards the marginalized and the outcast. Now, one of the people we visited last week when we were in Austin is our longtime friend, Jeff. Jeff's a high school principal, but also a member of the Army Reserves. And he was recently activated, and for the next year, he is serving alongside the U.S. Border Patrol in Laredo, Texas. This is the area of the border that the cartel is currently targeting for their drug smuggling. Jeff says it is a dark and scary and anxious and dangerous place. He's thankful that he gets to go home to his family on weekends, but for folks who live there and call Laredo home, it's just a heartbreaking situation. So as we read, we read on, that he entered this village and 10 men with skin diseases approached him. Keeping their distance from him, they raised their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, show us mercy. Now, what the common English Bible calls skin diseases, other translations call leprosy. So what is leprosy? Leprosy in the Bible was different from the disease that we once called leprosy, but that we know now as Hansen's disease. This is a serious disorder caused by bacterial infection whose symptoms are ulcerations, loss of feeling in certain nerve regions, even the loss of fingers and toes. And the term leprosy in the Bible, however, is used to describe a variety of skin diseases, which probably ranged from simple blemishes to serious rashes to more serious fungal and bacterial infections. Lepers were therefore somewhat common. Well, as we look back to the law of Moses, some 1300 years before Jesus's birth, we find very specific rules that were to be followed to, uh, and observed by someone who was suffering from one of these skin diseases. In Leviticus chapter 13, beginning in verse 45, we read, anyone with an infection of the skin disease must wear torn clothes, dishevel their hair, cover their upper lip and shout, unclean, unclean. They will be unclean as long as they are infected. They are unclean and they must live alone outside the camp. So in addition to suffering from one of these terrifying skin diseases, folks were ostracized and forced to live outside of their communities away from families and friends and with other folks who were also considered to be unclean. These diseases were common and frequently curable. So if you contracted leprosy, it didn't doom you forever as an outcast. There were techniques for quarantining and for healing and for ritual cleaning. I think the pandemic gave us all a better idea of what it feels like to be isolated. In the height of the pandemic, anxiety and depression and other related illnesses were running rampant. And so doctors began prescribing social activities like walks in nature, driveway meet and greets, and other non-traditional forms of medical treatment that required people to engage with one another. They knew and we learned that comprehensive healing cannot happen in isolation. It requires direct participation and it requires community. Now you might recall in biblical times when someone suffered a tragedy or got sick or was suffering from a disease, was thought to be punishment from God for a sin that they or one of their family members had committed. And over time, if they fully repented, God could forgive them and heal them. But only the priest could declare a person clean again so that they would be allowed back into their communities and with their families. But this was not how Jesus saw diseases. Over and over again in scripture, we read how Jesus sought out folks who were sick and had diseases and having the power and the compassion, he healed them. And so as Jesus entered into this village, these 10 lepers left their quarantine area to meet Jesus, acknowledging their impurity and keeping their distance and shouting from a distance, Jesus, master, show us mercy. The Greek word used here for mercy is alison. Last week in Pastor Brian's message, he talked about this same word that was used in the prayer of that tax collector as he prayed and stood at a distance, as he beat his breast and his eyes cast down at the earth. And he cried, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. This is a powerful prayer that has come to be known as the Jesus prayer. 
Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. This is a prayer that's easy to recall and it can be repeated over and over when we find ourselves in situations that we don't know what to do or what to say or even how to start praying. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Well, next, Jesus instructs the lepers to go and show themselves to the priest, the only ones who could declare them clean. And while they were on their way, Jesus made them clean. They responded with faith, and Jesus healed them simply by speaking. And once again, we see the power of Christ at work in this world. Now, this is the first part of the story. As we see Jesus' heart caring for the lepers, it reminds us that this is what we are called to do as followers of Jesus. We are called to see people who others look past, to have compassion and mercy and to offer hope and healing, to lift up the lowly. So ask yourself this, are there people in your life or maybe your community that you regard in a similar way or perhaps regard you in a similar way? Are there neighborhoods, communities, border towns, or nations that you would be afraid to travel through? Are there people who would hesitate to travel through the neighborhood where you live? And as we think about these things, we should ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? Now let's look at the second part of this story. One of them, when he saw that he had been healed, returned and praised God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. He was a Samaritan. So the hero of this story, it wasn't one of those nine Jews who didn't come back and thank Jesus, but instead, this doubly cursed Samaritan who not only had leprosy, but also was labeled as an outsider or an enemy. God's mercy is not limited to our human conventions regarding insiders and outsiders, even when the outsider is considered the enemy. The good news of this encounter carries a promise for us that through Jesus Christ, God empowers us to step across boundaries, to share mercy with outsiders, to pay attention to things worthy of praise, and to move forward into God's future with assurance that there is more to God's story than meets the eye. And for that, may we always give thanks. So this is a story about gratitude. 90% of the lepers who were healed didn't go back and thank Jesus. As I've been preparing this message this week, I've been giving this a lot of thought and I've been wondering, which leper am I most like? Am I like one of the nine who was healed and left without saying thank you or the one who returned? Which leper are you more like? You know, every single day there are blessings that come into our lives, but we don't always stop to say thank you. Let's just start with the simple fact that you woke up this morning. I have a friend who says, woohoo, every morning when he first wakes up. It's his way of saying, thank you, God, for the gift of another day. You know, I think we can give thanks for the rain this past week. Rain that melts snow and nourishes the earth as spring officially begins tomorrow. Woohoo! And we wait with great anticipation for signs of new life to burst forth from this earth. We can give thanks for food, relationships, warm homes, jobs, God's grace and mercy at work in our lives. And we can give thanks for this faith community called Messiah Church, a truly unique and blessed community. I don't know if you all realize this or not, but you have an amazing way of caring for one another, supporting one another, as well as our neighbors and the world. You embrace the value that John Wesley set forth before us when he said that we, that we may love alike even though we do not think alike. That's what the body of Christ is meant to be. And I want you to know that I see this in you. And for that, I do give thanks to God every single day. So do you remember to say thank you often enough? I know I don't. I mean, I want to. I set out each day to do so, but... I also know that I fall short. But the act of showing up to worship, like you're doing right now, is one way to say thank you to God. In fact, thank you God is what worship is all about. But thanking God is also an important part of our daily personal prayer life. See, we were made to, we were created to give thanks. 
In fact, a recent Barna research poll revealed that those with an active Christian faith who attend church, who read the Bible and pray, are more likely than other adults to say that they are very happy with their lives, that their faith is growing deeper, and that they are in excellent physical health. Well, if you are around in the fall of 2021, you might remember this message series that focused on these five spiritual practices that will help us grow as followers of Jesus Christ. And one of those practices is that we worship God through prayer. And our fist was meant to remind us that we are to pray together, just like we are doing here today in this worship experience. And then the other five fingers, they're to remind us to pray five times a day when we get up in the morning, before breakfast, before lunch, before dinner, and before we go to bed at night. This week, I want to challenge you to use those five fingers as a reminder to pray five times a day. And your prayer, it can be as simple as, thank you, God. So I want to close with this story about gratitude that's attributed to the 13th century German theologian, Meister Eckhart. On his way to church, a scholar was supposed to see a man, was surprised to see a man in tattered clothes and barefoot. Nonetheless, as a good Christian, he greeted the man, may God give you a good morning. The poor man replied cheerfully, I've never yet had a bad morning. Well, then may God give you good luck. I've never yet had bad luck. Well then, may God give you happiness. I have never yet been unhappy. The scholar then asked the man, could you please explain yourself to me because I don't understand. And the poor man replied, with pleasure. You wish me a good morning and yet I've never had a bad morning. For when I am hungry, I praise God. When I feel cold or when it's raining or snowing, I praise God. And that is why I have never had a bad morning. You wish that God would give me good luck. However, I have never had bad luck. This is because I live with God and always feel what God does for me is the best. Whatever God sends me, be it pleasant or unpleasant, I accept with a grateful heart. And that is why I have never had bad luck. And finally, you wish that God should make me happy, but I've never been unhappy. For all I desire is to follow God's will. I've surrendered my life so totally to God's will that whatever God wants, that is also what I want. And that is why I've never been unhappy. So let's do a heart check here. Do you have a grateful heart? Is there someone that you need to say thank you to today? The story of this grateful Samaritan leper illustrates two key messages here, grace and gratitude. And as followers of Christ, we are called to embody those two virtues each and every day. Let's pray. Loving God, as you journeyed to Jerusalem, you showed God's love and mercy to those whom others pushed away or overlooked altogether. Fill us with your compassion for those who are marginalized, despised, and ignored. For as we draw closer to them, you draw us closer to you. And for that, we give great thanks and praise. Amen. He became sin Who knew no sin That we might become His righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross, love so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah.
blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel. Thanks for joining us for Church on the Go. There's a, remember, there's a whole reading plan and a book study around the Gospel of Luke. If you're interested, visit messiahchurch.org Luke. We'll see you back here next week. <laughs>